I'm John Matthews, Senior Legal Counsel of the Justice Collaborative, and welcome to The Briefing, a co-production of The Appeal and Now This. Today, we're going to be talking about the crisis in Mississippi prisons. While people around the world are rising up in defense of Black lives, it's important to recognize that prisons across the United States inflict violence on the American people, including hundreds of thousands of Black people every day. In Mississippi prisons, people encounter rampant violence, decrepit conditions, and a culture of neglect and corruption. And now Mississippi officials have announced their intent to hire Burl Kane to oversee the state's prison system. The notorious former warden from Angola, a slave plantation turned prison in Louisiana. To talk about the crisis in Mississippi prisons and the nomination of Burl Kane and what that means, we are joined by executive director of the People's Advocacy Institute and steering committee member of Mississippi Prison Reform Coalition, Rukia Lumumba. To run more, co-director of People's Advocacy Institute and strong arms of JXN Credible Messenger Initiative, Denise Nisi Coleman, campaign director of the Mississippi Clemency Campaign for Incarcerated Women at People's Advocacy Institute, and NFL linebacker for the New Orleans Saints, Demario Davis, who's a member of the Players Coalition, working to end social injustices and racial inequality. First, a little context. Earlier this year, Rock Nation, Jay-Z's company, filed suit on behalf of Mississippi prisoners, alleging prison bosses did nothing to stop violence against inmates that left five people dead. Years of overcrowding and neglect have led to almost weekly deaths in Mississippi prisons. Nearly 50 people have died since November. And as the New York Times has reported, the US Department of Justice is now investigating underlying reasons for the wave of deaths including at Mississippi's Parchment Prison Facility, where many of the deaths have occurred. Last month, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves ended a four-month search for a new commissioner of corrections by nominating former Angola warden Burl Kane. The 77-year-old Kane stepped down from Louisiana's prison system amidst multiple investigations involving corruption, shady financial dealings, and inmate treatment. Kane hired close friends and family to cushy jobs and lucrative prison contracts. Some say the organizational chart and corporate partnership structure at Angola looked almost identical to the Kane family tree. Despite the cloud of corruption and allegations of abuse and, ne and negligence, the Mississippi State Senate moved to proceed with Kane's nomination. Our guests today are here to talk about the crisis in Mississippi prisons and what can be done to protect the people of Mississippi. Uh, Rukia, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us what is happening in Mississippi prisons and how we got here? Yeah, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? We can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, um, one, I want to say thank you for having me on the show. I apologize. Um, so I just want to say thank you for having me on 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 today um, for highlighting the work that's happening here in Mississippi. Can, okay. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty here. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? That's better. Okay. Um, so part of the issue is that um, we don't have the best internet service out here. And so um, I apologize because I have to be on my phone in order for you to hear me, but you can see me through my video. So I apologize if it's hard to, to see me and hear me at the same time. No problem. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, again, thank you. I'm Rukia Lumumba with the People's Advocacy Institute. Really appreciate you all lifting up the work that's happening here in Mississippi. Um, we have for decades been fighting against the Mississippi Department of Corrections and the state around the inhumane conditions, the horrific conditions that people have been living in um, who are locked inside of these cells throughout the state of Mississippi. Parchment Prison, which is an 18,000 acre plantation um, that started as a plantation before um, reconstruction and continued as a work and labor center after, as you so um, eloquently stated earlier, um, continues to be a place of oppression, of torture, and of inhumane treatment in the state of Mississippi. Um, so back in December of, um, of 
2019, just this past December, um, people inside were fed up. They had had enough, um, had enough of living literally in sewage and in toxic situations, um, literally living um, where sewage was in their cells and having to smell that daily, had enough of not having adequate food, um, being given very limited food every day, unhealthy food every day, and unsanitized conditions upon which they were supposed to eat their food. Um, and so what ended up happening is people on the inside began to revolt. Um, people on the inside began to rise up and say no more. And so that resulted in a lot of different consequences that resulted in deaths, that resulted in um, people um, being left without the opportunity to shower on lockdown for literally six weeks um, throughout um, the state of Mississippi uh, prison system, not just parchment, um, and that's a number of things. Currently, there are 20,000 people locked in Mississippi prisons. We know that a thousand of those people that are currently locked up are eligible for parole, have been granted parole, and literally have not been released because they haven't been able to meet one, the residency requirement and or two, the government is acting as if COVID is a reason not to release people back into their community. That is extremely problematic. So back in December, people began to rise up. In January, community began to stand up and take action on their behalf to demand that the governor began to release people and that Parchman prison be shut down for good. As a result of that uprising, both inside of the uh, taking lead from inside, people who are currently incarcerated taking lead and us following on the outside their lead, what ended up happening is we were able to push the governor to at least, at the very least, to at least sign a um, uh, required that the Mississippi Department of Corrections um, shut down Unit 29 in Parchment, which was one of the, the most egregious um, conditions were uh, felt there. That's not enough. We want to see the the entire prison shut down completely. It hasn't been renovated since the 1980s. It is horrible conditions. And I think we have some people on this call that can talk more about that. But in addition to that, we want to see some really core legislation passed. Um, we currently have Senate Bill 2123 that is uh, recently passed by the House and the Senate that would allow for parole eligibility, increase parole eligibility for people who are serving life sentences. And I wanna talk about that a little bit more later. And we also have House Bill 1024, um, which would allow for, um, that really tackles our um, horrible habitual offender um, laws that are currently on the books. And so I just wanna throw that out there a little bit. And before I move on and, and let others speak, I also wanna lift up the work that many of our steering committee members on the Prison Reform Coalition have been doing. You know, I wanna lift up the, the folks who have been literally daily, every day, fighting to ensure that people on the inside are getting the medical treatment that they deserve, are getting um, the legal support that they deserve. So I just wanna lift up um, the Mississippi Prison Reform Coalition steering committee members, as well as the coalition members um, in general. And um, those that are supporting us nationally, including um, Until Freedom, the Poor People's Campaign, um, you know, our crew of lawyers at the Mississippi Center for Justice and Law for Black Lives and the Center for Constitutional Right, uh, Color of Change, and a number of other folks, Danielle Holmes, Sharon Brown, Leah Campbell, Melissa Gargo, uh, Mishambi Lambright, Paloma Wu, Matthew Lawrence. I mean, I can go on and on. John Knight, Danielle Pierres, um, but just thank you again for having us. Love the shout outs. Um, no, appreciate you pro providing all that context, Rakia. Um, I'd like to bring in Tehran. Um, Tehran, you know, you were sentenced to, at 17, to serve life in prison without parole. Um, the Supreme Court later ruled those sentences were unconstitutional for juveniles after serving 19 and a half years, longer than you'd been alive at the time you were sentenced, parole was granted. Um, I'd like you to speak a little bit about your experience in the system for those two decades um, and how that it motivated you to devote your freedom to fighting that system. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank y'all for having me. It's a um, good opportunity for me to speak on that, um, on my experience in the Mississippi uh, prison system. So as you said, I was um, incarcerated at the age of 17 for um, my actions, you know what I'm saying? So first thing the prison system taught me was accountability. You know what I mean? Like, 
I had to look at my life and look at the decision I had made and and really just, you know, like you say, sit down and just see what's really going on. But at the same time, I can't can't lie, like, you know, a lot a lot brought me home, true enough, but it was a grace of God, you know what I'm saying? My grandma taught me to trust in Jesus. And he helped grow me up in prison, you know what I'm saying? No matter where I go and where I'm, I always say that, you know what I'm saying? So moving on, but my experience in prison, though, it was uh, it was hard, you know. Rakia just explained some of the conditions that been going on in the prison system. Like she said, they haven't been renovated since 80. I first went to Parchment in 2002. And, you know, uh, being incarcerated here in Mississippi is like the first thing you want to do is is uh, robbery of your hope, you know what I'm saying? You put in prison, no rehabilitation, you know what I'm saying? You in a harsh environment, you treated like an animal, and you know what I mean? It's like, what's the result? So I'm I'm a, I'm 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 happy that um the house signed that bill for 21, 23 also, because it give a lot of people who've been through the situation like me another chance of life. Like I came home, that system, I think, you know, the consequences of my action prepared me for who I am today. If I hadn't gone through all those harsh environments and rough times in there, it wouldn't, have, uh, it wouldn't develop me who I am, you know what I'm saying? And it wouldn't have me on this mission to fight for other people because I know you can make one mistake in life, but here, you know, you treat it like a slave, you treat it like some stock. They try to throw you away for the maximum when you're just a juvenile, you are you, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people in a situation like me that have been sentenced to life and even though the juvenile law was passed, they've been going back to court and being resentenced to life again, you know? And that's the way it is, you know, racism is a hard, hard peel here, you know what I'm saying? It's something we deal with here in the prison system, just like modern day slavery in Mississippi, because like I say, they throw you in there and they don't really give you no chance to help develop yourself or work on your character. And sometimes people go to prison, really might need some mental help, you know what I'm saying? It'd be a whole lot of underlying issues that lead to people committing crime. But at the end of the day, when you hear me, you know what I'm saying, we all make mistakes. and. I don't think one mistake should cause me the rest of my life and then not help me even better myself, but throw me away and put me in a situation where there's no hope, you know what I'm saying? Or where it's, it's just um, inhumane, you know what I'm saying? I'm underfed, you know what I'm saying? I, my health care bad, you know? For the people who survived it, they should be given another chance, you know what I'm saying? Because I believe uh, diamonds come from pressure, you know what I'm saying? And those people need to be allowed to be back in the, in the communities again, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of they contribute out here, you know, and just be a positive influence on life. And a lot of those brothers and sisters are missed from their community, you know what I mean? And that's a long-term effect, but it was part of a, a elaborate plot, you know what I mean? From poverty, from, you know, under education and all that lead to crime and crime lead to prison, you know, and it's all been just a, you know, a design plan, especially here in the South, you know, me being able to go there and see that and be being able to understand the, the conditions and see the uh, situation and know better. And I'm out here trying to make a way and team with other people who committed to help them get some people out, you know what I'm saying? To help them get some rehabilitation going on, really just forget prison reform, like closing prison down. Certain things don't, everybody don't need to go to prison. You got drug problems, you got mental health problems, you know? Right. So we can speak on that later, you know what I'm saying? I ain't, <laughs> no, I, I don't want to hold up. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate the work you're doing. Um, you mentioned you know, modern day slavery and the conditions there. You know, can you talk a little bit about Burl Kane um, and what, you know, how you feel about that choice? Um, and, it, you know, if we're thinking about modern day slavery conditions and the idea that someone's going to come in and help that situation, you know, how do you feel about this, this selection for, for the warden? Is I'm I'm gonna be honest with you, you know what I'm saying? We gotta realize like on what's going on now, you know what I'm saying? Cause the house bill just got signed yesterday, but we've been pushing for it, you know what I'm saying? The lawmakers be making you go through all these progresses, you know what I'm saying, to get to a point when they know it need to change. You know, but the the Kane situation happened way before George Floyd, you know what I'm saying? They had already hired him because that was the mindset that they look at individuals in prison, you know what I'm saying? I don't look at you as no human being, you know what I'm saying? You made a mistake, you locked up, you ain't nothing to them, you know what I'm saying? But a way for them to profit. So hiring another slave on to watch over the slaves is how I see you, you know? I just call a spade a spade, you know what I'm saying? If your tracker, you 77 years old, most people I know they're old, stuck in their way. So you know what I'm saying? How can we be looking for a change when we you know, hiring people who got a set mindset, you know what I'm saying? They got one way of thinking, you feel? What do you think his way of thinking is? 
man, he don't care nothing about no black people, and especially about no prisoners, you know what I'm saying? All I see is what a, what you described from the beginning, all I seen was a person looking to make profit, you know what I'm saying? A way to, uh, and what better business in the South than big business in Mississippi prison, especially, you know what I'm saying? You're profiting off these guys. Canteen is, uh, you know what I'm saying, another way of extorting brothers, you know what I'm saying? I know I'm in communication with a lot of my people still because I can't never forget that experience. And that's why I fight for why I fight, you know. But I know that, you know, they extort them with the canteen. They go up and it's a forced buy because the food they feed you ain't, you know what I'm saying, ain't adequate to keep you healthy. You know, like it really is a strong survive, you know what I'm saying? And God looking out for us all, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, Ota Kane, that's just another overseer, you know what I'm saying? What he what what ideas he done presented since he been hired? What has he said that he finna do to help, you know what I'm saying, correct some of the problems in our prison system, you know what I'm saying? Have we heard any of that? You know what I'm saying? No, you know what I'm saying? He's trying to hide from the fact of what he done in the past. You know, any man that can't hold up and be accountable for their action, then you know, to me ain't no man, I don't care how old you get. You can get old as hell and still be, you know, still be having a young mind. I appreciate your your perspective and all the work you've, you've been doing. Um, I'd like to bring in Nisi to the, Nisi, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. So, you know, you served 38 years for a crime you didn't commit. Um, can you walk us through what happened with your with your case? I think you're muted still. Not yet. It's okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out, we'll come back to you Nisi while we figure out the, the tech issues. Um, Demario. Oh, actually we got, we got Nisi. Hi. How are you? Hi everybody. It is with great pleasure and I'm honored to be here today. I'm gonna just go off of what, uh, right behind Tehran. Um, the prison system is a horrible place. The, it was designed to, not, not for any human being, it was de designed to destroy the human being. And they do a good job of it. I was in that place and I was in there a very, very long time. 38 years I served. And I'm telling you that it was a horrible place. It was horrible for my mind. It was horrible for my body physically. It was horrible for any and everything that could happen to me happen. Did I know how to deal with it? I had to learn how to deal with it. It was nobody to help, nobody. All the sisters in there, they're struggling. All the brothers, they're striving. They're striving to be better people. They have to feed off each other. That's what we do. We feed off each other. We uplift each other. We encourage each other because there's nobody else to help us. There's nobody who wants to say, hey, why don't you come do this? If you're a lifer, it's like you throw it away. Nothing else is happening. Nobody is looking at you as a person who say, maybe this person made a mistake. This person has potential to do and be better according to how they're serving their time, especially if they are no troublemaker. So these sisters, just, they got sisters inside that's really, really brilliant sisters that really push and read the law but you can't even get a law book. You can't even, you're not even subjected to anything about the law. You have to listen to everything on the TV when you can look at something like the news or hear something like um, uh, a newsletter from somebody or some kind of way that information or materials is coming into prison. And you're not, it's not a guarantee that you're gonna get that information. Sisters are sick, they're striving, they are doing everything that they can do to make it. I read about it all the time. When they send letters to the organization, what we see is who died. Since COVID has come into effect, we're hearing who died. We used to get sanitized in DC, but we're not getting sanitized anymore. It's not coming in MDOC, CMCF, MDOC, like it should be. We're not provided with that. We used to get it all the time. Now we might get it every two weeks sanitizer with COVID. They're saying who died, how many died? Two died this week, three died last week. 
oh my God, it's just ridiculous. And the conditions as far as the bathroom, as far as the kitchen, as far as the dining room, how we live in, we struggling, we surviving. It's only by the grace of God that any of us make it. I thank God that I am free. I thank God that I've been, I won't say so much free. I say released from prison because my fight is that my sisters be free and I won't ever be free until they all are free. As far as incarceration, they should take that word and just, I don't know, do something else with it. Decarcerate, yes, that's what I see. Abolish it, yes, that's what I see. That's what we fight for and that's what I, that's how I feel about it, seriously. Lisi, thank you so much for your strength and for really um, invoking all the sisters that are there because I, oftentimes we hear about the brothers, but the sisters um, exactly. are left behind and, we, and they're not a part of the conversation. So I appreciate your strength. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, clemency is really rare. Um, so I'd like you to talk about how the lack of that, that remedy really affected your experience and ability to, to be free. And okay, with well, I didn't, um, I didn't get clemency, but I encourage clemency because I know it could happen. I know that when you have exhausted every avenue that you can, and these sisters are inside, brothers too, but I talk about, I'm like you, I'm speaking on the sisters because that's what I know. And that's the place where I was. And nobody talks about the sisters. So I speak on them because I know their struggle. I know that they want to come out if they are given a chance. But the clemency, it's for those who, those who are, have elderly, some people have come of age, they've been working, they, they're still working. At 77 years old, they're still working and they're not really even um, physically fit to work, but just to have something to do for them. So what we're doing now, we, I have all my postcards here. We're gonna write and send postcards to Tate Reeves we are asking him to really consider releasing those who are elderly, the aging, the infirm. We, we, we want him to just, the legislation to please come on, please, please consider releasing these people in prison that's been in there for a long 25 years, 30 years, 77 years old and up, 65 on up, 55 on up. These people are not no harm to anyone. We're just asking for Tate Reeves in the legislature to give us a chance. Give them a chance. Look at their cases, do what you do, but give them a chance. You are the pin pushers. You are the ones who signed and said that somebody could be considered for parole. So our clemency and us working, we're doing all we can. And I'll, I won't stop. I will keep on. I will keep on. Because if you have any type of compassion and you speak freedom and you speak that about uh, um, um, decarceration, really, are you just talking words or do you mean that? If you mean that, then let us know it. Don't let us keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Well, we're not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna keep on going. That is what I have in my heart that is my passion. That is what I want to see for my sisters is their release. And I thank you for thank you, allowing me that. Yes. <laughs> I thank you. Uh, Demario, um, I'd, like you to, I'd like to bring you in. You know, you've done a lot of advocacy in this area. Um, a bit of background for our viewers. You know, Demario is part of the Players Coalition, which was formed in support of racial equality and social justice. Demario, you were born in Mississippi and you participated in protests at Parchman prison facility, as well as across the state in support of decarceration. Um, I'd like to ask you, you know, what did Parchman represent to you growing up and what is happening in the prison today or prison advocacy? Um, well, first I just say, you know, what an honor it is for me to stand alongside the true activists um, and people who are uh, engaged in this fight on a daily. Um, it's an honor for me to be a part of it. Uh, it's an honor for me to be able to use my platform to help to help amplify the voices that really matter. The voices that you have heard before me are, are much more important in this space than my voice. 
But what I get to do is kind of help amplify the messaging that um, that they are sharing. And it's almost like, uh, say it again for the people in the back. Um, I think we need to start by understanding most people who are looking in need to realize how dehumanizing uh, makes it okay for us to kill people. That's evil. What we like to do is label black people, label criminals, label thugs. That is a term to dehumanize someone. Because once you dehumanize them, it, it releases your, con your conscience to be, make it okay for them to die. Once you have dehumanized them and say they are criminal, you can throw them away, don't have to worry about them. You're not owed any responsibility to them. And that's why we see where black people, where you see uh, inmates are being treated worse than, than we treat dogs. Dogs live like royalty in our country. And we kill black people in the streets. We, let's just talk about parchment. At parchment, before COVID-19 uh, became a world pandemic, there, there were already people dying at this prison at alarming rate. In January alone, nine people had already died, and by April, 18 people had died. That's worse, that's that's more deaths than the entire state of Texas, Colorado, and Nevada. In one prison. It serves a size of about 3,300, and, and now at June, there have been 44 deaths. 44 deaths in a prison, 3,300 population. The prison system, the state prison system in Florida has 94,000 people and there have only been 33 deaths. So when you want to look at the extreme conditions, we're saying that this is okay. This is happening in our state. And I like my brother Teron because he talked about his faith in God and what carried him through. We like to profess ourselves to be believers. This isn't Christ-like in any type of way, this is evil, this is wickedness, and we're making it okay because we're saying, you know what, they're criminals, so it don't matter. That's because we dehumanize them in our mind and we have to move away from that, that's not okay. Uh, a doctor said, a doctor out of Washington, Mark Stein said, this is the worst jail that he has been in his entire, his entire 20 years of, uh, of being in the field. The conditions are, are far worse than any that he's ever seen at Parchman Prison. So when we get to talking about Parchman Prison, there is no reform in this. The conditions are, are worse than anywhere else in the country. It was built out of a slave plantation mentality. If we're going to take down our state flag, finally, because of what it represents, we got to close this prison now. We have, to close, we have to close the prison down. There's no reform in this. And then when we're talking about where do we go from here um, and, 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 and what, is, what, is, what is our state going to do behind this, um, there, was, there was a lawsuit filed in January to improve conditions. Um, and people still fight tooth and nail behind that. Uh, the Department of Justice began an investigation in February. We're still waiting to see what's going to happen from that. The governor ordered one of the units to be closed down. That was a horrible unit. But we need to see the whole thing shut down. And then we appoint Burr Kane. And I'm not going to talk about him, but there's only one, uh, there's only one institution worse than parchment in the U.S., and that's Angola. Now, I'm just so happy to be from Mississippi and be playing football in New Orleans. So I'm like, okay, God, why you got me standing right here? But we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. So even though that have, it doesn't matter who we bring in to oversee parchment, that facility has to go. Those conditions are inhumane. You hear a young man and a young lady talk about being treated like animals. The greatest sign of empathy is you have to listen to where the complaint is coming from. You have to have people at the table who've been through those conditions. 
you we people who have never been through those conditions can't be the ones making the decisions or what's in the best interest. Well, I think you're frozen. Well, we'll we'll loop you back in once uh, the internet um, situation is is figured out. But no, I, I really appreciate Demario's comments. Um, there was a Players Coalition Listen and Learn um, tour in in Georgia, and you could see that anybody who went into the courtroom and, and saw the the rows of black men lined up in chains and the charges that they were facing. Like nobody left that courtroom the same. Um, and it's because like this idea of empathy, right? Like just like seeing what people are going through and experiencing. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with prisons is people go to prison and they're, they're forgotten, right? We just don't even know what's happening there. So I appreciate all of you um, for bringing to light um, the real experience of what's happening in these places. I'd like to bring in some polling before opening up to the panel. Uh, we have polling from the Justice Collaborative Institute with data for, for progress, which shows that seven in 10 voters nationally support measures to reduce prison and overcrowding and improve conditions. Um, this question is for the whole panel. Do you see a similar appetite for change in Mississippi? And the follow-up will be, is there a disconnect between lawmakers and residents? Um, and, you know, and what forces are preventing these changes? And we can start with, uh, with Nisi. Um, unmuted. You good? We good? We yes, okay. ma'am. This, this is this is what I want to want to say. First of all, can I just step back a minute and say about Burl Kane? What I've heard, I don't know the man, but everyone that I know that has suffered incarceration and who's doing this, been impacted by incarceration and doing this work. I said, what about Burl Kane from New Orleans? This is what I get. We don't want to talk about him. We don't have nothing to say. It was no answer of no, no kind. Now, as far as everything else, I'm just like, the prison system, and it's what uh, DiMario said, it's dehumanizing, all of it. The community, that's our job. That's where we go. The people matter in the community. What they have to talk about is organizing. We want to hear from them. Those who have loved ones inside, we want to hear from them because they have the answer. Really, the people, let the people decide. Let the people know what they want and tell us what they want so we could go hard and support as a whole entire community collectively and step up and say to the legislation, parchment need to be shut down. Parch parchment need to be closed. It need to be demolished. It need to be, it's not fit for nobody. CMCF, the same thing. It need reconstructuring. That's what it needs. The whole system. They need to start over at the table from the head all the way down to the janitors. It need to be redone, the whole system, the whole prison system. It is horrible. And how many people all over the world are saying the same thing? DiMario is saying the same thing. It needs to be shut down. People in the streets, in the community, they're saying the same thing, shut it down. People that's getting out of prison advocating for those that are inside. How many times do we have to say and keep on pushing this fight as far as tearing it down, close it down? It's not fit. It's not suitable for the human being. It's mental. It's distracting. And it is disturbing to all people. Absolutely. Um, Teron, have you noticed any political changes? Um, like, What's the environment looking like? to you, you know, we're talking about um, directly impacted folks and, and their experience, but in, in the community and in the political um, atmosphere, is, they, is this changing? Are people gonna actually do something? Oh, 
on the on the ground, like we say, the people with the boots on the ground, the people connected and closely affected by the situation, like Mario said, the Mario said earlier, you know what I'm saying? People who not impacted are not gonna understand. And like your question posed earlier, that's where the disconnect is between lawmakers and the people who are impacted by these things, you know what I'm saying? Because number one, we can understand, I believe we all can admit that the laws uh, you know, not really for us, you know what I'm saying? The lawmakers getting in trying to uphold some other laws that were meant to design to punish us, you know what I'm saying? And the disconnect is when we gonna get somebody who willing to change, you know? It's a it's a thirst for change in Mississippi right now. It's a lot of people looking for change and we trying to stop the overcrowding of the prison, you know what I'm saying? Releasing people, you know, people campaigning for bail fund and you know what I'm saying, um, parole initiatives. But yeah, that's what we want. You know what I'm saying? Lawmakers just be saying they gonna do it. You know what I mean? Like uh, the other night we were trying to educate people up on they still can vote and they not been disenfranchised. Voting important right now, you know what I'm saying? It's your chance to vote these people out who ain't really to make a change. All the people that was made for the flag, you know, it kind of say a lot, you know what I'm saying? And what you in support of, you in support of hatred and slavery and evil, you know what I'm saying? So. We can understand that the prison system, people do make mistakes and there should be some form of accountability, but at the same time, we don't need to be no evil, you know what I'm saying? You don't need to be tortured and punished for that reason. And yeah, on the ground, Mississippians, we wanna, we wanna stop that, you know what I'm saying? We don't want the overcrowding of the prison. We need people to come home, recognize that people deserve another chance. Is the, can we get this connected to the lawmakers, you know what I'm saying, to actually make it done, you know what I'm saying? They took a step forward yesterday so, you know what I'm saying? Hopefully that's a you know, step forward in the right direction. But saying you're gonna release people and releasing people is two different things. Definitely. Uh, Rakia, you know, you mentioned the legislation and, and the change that's already happening. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, recognize, I know you all have a hard stop in about five minutes. So I'd like to bring you, uh, Rakia in and then Demario for, you know, some closing uh, statements. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, the legislation piece is really critical to this, this struggle. It is critical because it doesn't matter who you put into these offices, as Demario has indicated, who's going to run Mississippi Department of Corrections if we're still creating laws that over-incarcerate in the first place, that cause mass incarceration to run rampant. Um, like I indicated, we need true legislation reform. Right now we have SB, Senate Bill 2123 that has been passed by both the House and the Senate. Um, it's time for Tate Reeves to now sign that and make sure that it goes into law. That will allow for parole eligibility for folks who have been serving long sentences to have an uh, um, opportunity to get out sooner rather than later. We also wanna see Tate Reeves sign House Bill 1024 which um, allows for people who have been incarcerated um, as habitual offenders to actually, who are serving life prison sentences to actually have an opportunity to be granted parole and to be released. Um, one of the other things, a few other things that we definitely need Mississippi legislators and the governor to do immediately, and some of this can be done through an executive order, is that we need to see aging people in prison released. We know that there are 18% um, of people inside of Mississippi prisons right now are aging, are elders in prison, and they need to come home. People in prison who age in prison age at a greater rate than any of us here out on the outside. Additionally, they are the least to come home and recidivate or, or, um, or end up back in prison. Or or end up back in prison. So we definitely want to see them come home. We want to see them come home. Um, we also know that there are people who were charged as juveniles with life without the possibility of parole, similar to Tehran, who had the who had the blessing, you know, through a lot of support, through really his own like home was able to come home. But there are at least 86 people inside of Mississippi prisons right now who were charged as juveniles and they need to come home. And the Mississippi legislators and governor need to let them out. And right now, they are still not, have not been granted um, relief. They still are sitting behind prison walls, even though the Supreme Court of the United States has said that they need to be released. And so we need to fight for that as well. Um, and then, you know, we need to really do some work here in Mississippi around ensuring that people are able to get out and get out and have transitional housing and affordable places to live and be able to really reintegrate into society in the best way possible. This whole idea that we need to be tough on crime and not rehabilitate people is ridiculous. We've seen over and over and over again for years that it is illogical. 
it is illogical to lock people up, treat them as animals, and then bring them back out into a community and think that they're going to be able to survive when they have no economic stability opportunity, no housing, no ability to do anything. We're literally creating a system that is based on failure. And so right. we need to change all of that. And I'm, I, I'm going to pass it on. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Demario, um, any final words of wisdom, um, calls to action? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, yeah, uh, I just agree. I just agree with everything that that has been said and that has been spoken. Um, number one, like these these ain't even my words. This is just amplifying what's been what's being screamed to to people. That it's obviously like I, I, I guess the right ears are not hearing. Number one, parchment needs to be closed down. It's not. We're not interested in reform. It needs to be closed down. And then you hear you hear the response, okay, so if it's closed down, then, then where are those people going? Well, that's a great question. Let's answer that. Do all of those people have to be in prison? Let's start there. Like, let's talk about these, these the, 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 the little good that's coming out of it. Uh, Senate Bill 2123 uh, that Rakia talked about. Uh, making eligibility for parole um, for people who've been, who've been, you know, spent these long sentences, uh, and then uh, letting people out quicker if they were, if they were uh, being eligible for parole if there was nonviolent offenses. Um, and then what's in the mix? House Bill 1024, um, the habitual offender laws that are that are keeping their people there for for uh, these long sentences. Our elderly group. Nobody should be locked up and said, we forget about you for life. Prison is a form of discipline. You messed up, get yourself together. And then when you get yourself together, you can reintegrate into society. I, you know, we've been fighting this stuff in part of court. This, how are you gonna make somebody pay a debt to society? And then when they get out, you still force them to pay a debt. Right. They pay their debt with their time more than they did most of them. And so how do we get our, our elderly? It's so many people that don't pose a threat to our society that are locked up right now. So when you talk about where they go, they find ways to reintegrate them into society, which answers the next question. How do we do that best? Rehabilitation programs that Tehran talked about. So that they're prepared to, to reintegrate when they get out. Reentry programs on the outside, which Rukia was speaking about. That's what we need to be thinking about. We need to be closing parchment down. We need to sign these bills into law and get them going so that we can get people uh, eligible for parole. So helping people in the system, look at our, look at our elderly that are there, seeing how ways we can get them out and get out of this concept that we can lock people up for life and throw away the key. And, and the ones that we don't throw away from life, just think you're gonna throw, throw them in a the cage and they're gonna come back and be ready to integrate into society. You better look at the Khalid, we should look at the Khalid Browder story and realize what 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 prison does to the psyche, and so yeah. we need to we need we need we need to we need to think about all these things and addressing these issues because um, directly or indirectly, this is going to affect us all. Absolutely, it's going to affect us all, you know. And so you lock somebody up in your community, throw them in a cage, and treat them like an animal, and then let them back out. What do you think that means to your community? You know, and so uh, we need to address this issue. And we need to address it uh, immediately. This isn't. Uh, something that we can delay with. Uh, these are lives that are on the line and, and, and lives that are counting on us on the outside to do the right thing. And we all we all need to have uh, the urgency um, that that Tehran and uh, uh, Miss Denise have because you know they've experienced it. Yep. No, absolutely. I think it's a perfect uh, point to close on. Uh, this is urgent. So um, you've heard the calls of action. We have to end. We have in a few minutes, a district attorney form out of Travis County in Texas. But I appreciate all of your time. Um, and, and I know you'll continue the fight and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with you uh, later on. So take care and uh, um, be safe.